The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? So for the better part of 10 years, I've had the privilege of flying around the country quoting my favorite quote on leadership. Leadership is disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. <laughs> what it means is that in a rapidly changing world, leadership is always about learning and about loss. It's always about navigating loss and the deep need for learning. And that both of those begin with the leader. So what's wrong? The high-priced consultant was sitting in my church office. We had brought him in to try to answer that question. On the surface, it didn't look like anything was wrong. As a matter of fact, we were feeling pretty good. All the markers of churches that you usually look at were going in the right direction. The only problem that is, as a pastor, I knew deep in my gut that this wasn't all good news. I'd seen the look of my elders' eyes. You know that look when they begin to roll their eyes when you talk about doing some new, great missional activity for God? Do you know that deep sigh that they get when they're wanting to resist, but they don't want to resist right to your face? That was what I was encountering every day in my congregation. So we brought in the consultant. He did what consultants do and looked under the hood and prepared a report and met with me in my office. And I looked at him and said, so what's wrong? And he looked at me and he said, you. He said, Todd, the very leadership style that you use to bring the church this far is now chafing. The culture that you created is now a culture that is caving in on itself. The things that you did could now be your undoing. Because the world is changing dramatically. And because it's changing dramatically, you need to change also. You're going to need to learn to lead all over again. In 2011, Fuller Seminary, where I now serve as the vice president, asked our alumni a very similar question. We went to them and said, how do you feel about Fuller Seminary? And we got this response back. We love Fuller. We love Fuller. We love the professors that we learned from. We love the, thing we love the things we learned. We're proud to be alums. It's great. But Fuller didn't prepare me for the world that I'm in. In about 10 years of doing co coaching and consulting with pastors over and over and over again, when they finally get to the place where they trust me, they'll tell me the exact same thing. I have all these degrees. I have all this experience. I have all these things I've done. I have all these accomplishments. But the world is changing so dramatically. Seminary didn't prepare me for the world that I'm in. They need to learn to lead all over again. One of the problems is that for most of us in seminaries, we have had, as one of my colleagues says, um, the theological camels model. Uh, we believe that seminarians are like camels who need to make it through the desert to the promised land. And our job is to cram them full of as much theological and spiritual food as we possibly can. We get about two or three years with them. We get them all filled up to the gills. Then we slap them on the rump, send them across the desert, hope they'll make it to the promised land. Maybe they'll run out of juice and they'll maybe have to find an oasis along the way. And when they do, uh, you know, a doctor of ministry course. We'll, we'll cram some more stuff into them so that they can make it. But what happens if the, um, they come across the sand dune and they find themselves not in an oasis but a rainforest? Or Silicon Valley? Or a barrio? Or Wall Street? or Main Street? What if information won't do the job? What if it's not about needing more information? What if it's actually about needing whole life transformation for a changing context? 
50% of our students at Fuller today do not go into traditional church ministry, 50%. They go into the marketplace, into arts, into healthcare, into education. Last year in my classes, I had one student who came from McKenzie, another student who was a filmmaker, and a third who was a, 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 a t public school teacher in the inner city. This is normal today. Our students are no longer just people preparing for the church work. And so what the church needs from seminary today is for us to transition from seeing ourselves as people who prepare pastors for ministry instead be about forming leaders for mission. We need to go from pastor preparation to lifetime leadership formation because in a changing world, we need to know that everything in front of us is completely different than everything behind us. That nothing in front of us is the same as that which is behind us. Let me give you an example from August 12th, 1805. Meriwether Lewis walked up the side of a hillside. He had just finished 15 months, 15 months with William Clark and the Corps of Discovery going upstream, 15 months of paddling upstream. They had been sent by Thomas Jefferson to find a water route that would connect the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean, a water route that they needed for the economic survival of this new nation, a water route that everybody knew was there. A water route that people had been looking for for 300 years. A water route that had already been drawn on several maps. It just needed someone to find it. <laughs> Meriwether Lewis walked up the side of that mountain assuming that the entire way that he had had a long, gradual, slow uphill would now lead to a long, slow, gradual downhill that they would take their canoes, they would go over a half a day portage, they would put it into what we now know is the Columbia River, they would then coast downstream all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They would take a selfie, they would send it back to Jefferson, they would head home. But when Meriwether Lewis walked up the side of what is the Lemhi Pass, he discovered not a water route, but the Rocky Mountains. 300 miles of mountains. Now, they had been told by the Mandan tribe that you're going to have to get through some mountains, but the mental model they had within them was the Shenandoah Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. Anybody been to Shenandoah National Park? It's beautiful, those rolling hills. It's incredible. I'm from California. We would have turned those suckers into condos a long, long time ago. Because when we think about mountains, we know we're talking about jagged 10,000 foot plus peaks that you need to navigate. It's August, winter's coming. What do they do? The world in front of them is nothing like the world behind them. This is where the church is today, dear friends. This is exactly where we find ourselves. We're in exactly this epical moment where we're seeing the world that we've known pass away. A friend of mine has spent his 40 years of his ministry in the belt buckle of the Bible belt. And I asked him how the world has changed and how the church has changed, even there in a place like Alabama. And he said to me, look, 40 years ago in Alabama, we never worried about church growth or church attendance or any of those things. We never worried about it. We didn't keep track of it. We didn't care. Because the bottom line was this. If a man, man, Missed church on Sunday, his boss asked him about it at work on Monday. If your financial future and security is tied to your church attendance, guess what that does to church attendance in the town, right? This was the world that is passing away. This is the world that we understand. The world where every city father, and they were fathers, right, laid out the town square with the courthouse, the library, and the first church of whoever got there first. First Baptists, first Methodists, first Presbyterians. And all the other first churches would be on 2nd Street because everybody knew that the center of society was law, education, and religion, and that religion was mostly Christianity. I have in my office a copy of the Los Angeles Times newspaper from December 1963. Somebody saved it because the cover of it is got the story about John F. Kennedy's assassination and the Warren Commission. It was a historical artifact. 
They gave it to me because on the back page of the front section was an article about the then 9,000 member Hollywood Presbyterian Church, a church that Mark Roberts and I served when it was about 3,500 members, a church that's under 1,000 members today. I kept it because in the corner of the LA Times, there in the front section, there's actually a little box where the LA Times used to publish for everybody's help and edification a list of daily Bible readings. Can you imagine or remember a day where the LA Times helps you with your morning quiet time? <laughs> this world, this world that is behind us is what we call the Christendom world. It's the world where not everybody was a Christian, but the world in which Christianity had the home court advantage where Christianity had cultural power and privilege, where being a Christian was something that at least in our personal lives and our private lives, we were able to do without fear, and that it was supported by many structures of the culture. This is the world that is, gone bef that is, gone, that is passing away. This is the world that is passing away, and this is the world that we are not prepared for. We need to learn to lead all over again. What does this mean for us? that in uncharted territory, leadership is about a lifetime of learning. It means that you can't just get a degree or have your experience or build your resume and expect that it'll carry you all the way through. That you can be the very best canoeer possible, but if you run out of water, you gotta drop the canoes. And, that, and let's be clear about this. Lewis and Clark were water guys. They were river runners. When they got to the top of the Lemhi Pass, Meriwether Lewis said, we proceeded on. One of his men wrote, they were the most horrible mountains we ever beheld. <laughs> and this is where we find ourselves today. Don't we wish we could just go back to those good old days, at least days that were good for people who look like me? Don't we wish that we could go back and just paddle harder and make it through? Don't we wish? I mean, for so many of us, this is exactly where we find ourselves today. I mean, if 1963 ever comes back, we Presbyterians are going to rule. We're going to own that. We are great in 1963. But if God takes us into uncharted territory, we must acknowledge that we are the kinds of leaders who need to be humble, who need to keep learning. The hardest three words for humans to say are not, I love you or I forgive you. They are, I don't know. There was a study done of children by the age of seven. If you ask a child a nonsense question, like what shape is blue or what do feet have for breakfast? The vast majority of seven-year-olds will make up an answer <laughs> rather than say, I don't know. One business has lost a billion dollars, a billion dollars, on an advertising campaign that they know doesn't work because the marketing department was afraid to tell the boss that they didn't have a better idea. This is why leadership development and Christian formation that brings about humility must be at the center of all that we do. We need to be lifetime learners. And particularly, we need to learn to listen to the voices at the margins. When Lewis and Clark stepped over the Lemhi Pass, there was only one person who was not lost. There was only one person who was on familiar terrain. One person who had been, uh, one person who had been kidnapped into slavery. One person who had been sold in a card game. One person who had become the common law wife. A woman, a Native American, a teenage nursing mother. One person, Sacagawea. She was the only one who was an expert. She was the only one who was on familiar terrain. She was the only one who was going home. 
Dear friends, as we step over into uncharted territory, the experts are the people who had no cultural power in Christendom, who had no privilege or power in Christendom. As we step into the world where we have no cultural power, when we need to, when we need to bring the gospel and the full measure of the gospel, leading transformation in the name of Jesus, if we're going to be those kinds of people who are going to be successful, we need to find and listen to the Sacagaweas. Those who can take us through the country and take us to the promised land. This requires learning and loss of ego and status and control. Let me close with my, final, my favorite story from Lewis and Clark. They finally made it to the Pacific Ocean. They finally got there. And because they would have to spend the winter there, they found themselves having to uh, establish a fort there in what is now Oregon. This would be the first American outpost of the new nation, the first American outpost in the Pacific Northwest. Because it was a military command, Lewis and Clark had the complete authority to establish this territory as American territory. They had complete authority. They could just say it and it would be done. But because they had traveled so far off the map, and that this core had turned into a community of deep trust, they decided at that moment to do an incredibly American thing. Instead of declaring it to be true, and instead of declaring the fort to be an American territory, they gathered together the entire core, and they took a vote. They gave everybody in the core of discovery a vote. Everyone. Everyone including Sacagawea, and including William Clark's slave, York. The first time that a Native American, a woman, and an African American cast a vote in the United States of America was in 1805, so far off the map that they were in the future. I believe that God, dear friends, is taking us into the future so that we can bring God's future to this world. That he is taking us off the map into the place where we can now find ourselves bringing to the world what only God knows to be true. When we can bring his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it will be in heaven. When we can become the kinds of people who will be so transformed by the journey that God can use us to lead the world into God's own future. It means going beyond our culture, beyond power, beyond privilege, off the map into every place of the world and being the kinds of people who there can learn, deal with the loss, and lead. And seminaries need to teach leaders how to learn to lead all over again. Thank you.